the finance department at the Stockholm School of Economics. So here we do research, teaching at school, and a PhD program for the whole of Sweden. That's the national center part of it. And we have databases for the whole of Sweden. And that's also the national center part of it. Uh, seminars like this, conferences, where the private sector, the public sec sector, and academia can meet on a neutral platform, sort of on an academic neutral platform to discuss matters of mutual interest. And that's what we're doing today, exactly that. And I should say also, this is being filmed. So more people than you can listen to this if they didn't have the, uh, the possibility to come here. So if you ask questions, you should wait for a microphone. And we have mi one microphone here and one microphone there. So it will all be, be on tape. So uh, that's the background. Today we will talk about ETFs, ex exchange traded funds. And to prepare for this, Michael Hallinger, whom I will introduce in one minute, uh, sent me a survey article on ETFs. And I will quote that as an, as an introduction. It says, ETFs are perhaps the greatest game changer in the asset management industry in the first decades of the 21st century. These investment vehicles offer a combination of features that have not been available to investors before. Low cost transactions, intraday liquidity, and passive uh, index tracking. The rise of ETFs is part of a wider process that has taken place in the asset management industry over the last three decades. Passive management has expanded while at the same time the asset management la landscape has become more concentrated. The title of this seminar is ETF's solution or problem. That intro made it sound like a solution, but there are sort of identified problems and issues with, with this in the instrument, and that's what we will discuss. So the first 30 minutes, Michael Halling, who is sitting here, who is uh, an assistant associate professor, sorry, at the department, I al almost promoted you there, uh, at the Department of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. He has two PhDs, uh, one in computer science and one in finance from Vienna, Austria, and has been active at, at uh, universities in the US before. Luckily for us coming here to, to Stockholm to spend time here. His special areas of interest are in equity returns, mutual funds, and empirical corporate finance. And our practitioner of the day is Mats Nyman, uh, from Handelsbanken. Mats is um, investment strategist at, Han strategist at Handelsbanken and has held various positions at Handelsbanken. Uh, he has a master from the Stockholm School, School of Economics uh, and has spent a couple of years as political analyst at the, at the Ministry of Finance along the way. Uh, and when they, and he has been given 50 minutes or so to comment on, on ETFs. And after that, we should have 30 minutes. And I strongly encourage you to ask questions or sort of voice opinions. It doesn't have to be a question or whatever and take part of the discussion. So once again, very much welcome. And please, Michael Halling, the floor is yours. <coughs> OK, so good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you hear me well. I'm not very used to talking to microphones. That's a very special situation, but I hope uh, I'll manage. Uh, as Per said, my name is Michael, uh, and I work at Schoff and at uh, Stockholm School of Economics. And uh, today I'll um, introduce you a little bit to the academic perspective uh, on exchange-traded funds. Uh, to jump right into the topic uh, in terms of interest, in, in sort of the uh, terms of interest and time. So the basic outline is that I would like to introduce very quickly how ETFs are set up so that uh, there's a, a fundamental understanding about how these products are actually structured to deliver what they're designed to deliver. Then um, show you a couple of statistics uh, about the growth in the ETF industry, which has been very substantial and impressive over the last few years. And then um, boil, sort of come down to the ultimate question of this uh, event here about whether they are a solution or a problem, so talking about the benefits and the potential risks of these products. And in terms of the risks, we'll uh, sort of try to think a little bit about the investor perspective and also think a little bit more in terms of macro uh, 
uh, sense in terms of what are the con potential consequences for capital markets. Now, uh, uh, in some sense, pair with the quote already sort of uh, uh, summarized uh, my presentation. Um, so the key uh, sort of idea of an ETF is that it's an investment vehicle that is very closely linked uh, to a benchmark index uh, in, all, uh, in most situations and basically uh, behaves very much like an uh, index mutual fund uh, that most people are very uh, well aware of. Uh, but the key difference, as I will sort of uh, elaborate more in a few minutes, is going to be that uh, the exchange traded fund is, as the name says, traded on an exchange. And that means there's intraday liquidity and you can basically buy and sell uh, those ETF shares at any point in time during the day. Uh, and another key advantage is, as has also been mentioned, that it's a um, uh, relatively speaking a low cost product and so it offers uh, a different sort of fee profile than most funds. Uh, in terms of history actually it's not such a new product. Uh, the first ETF goes back to the year 1993. It's uh, sort of the most famous one and still the largest one, the Spider, uh, that was issued by State Street and it's tracking the S&P 500. It's by a huge gap the largest ETF that is traded currently in the world. Uh, it sort of, as of September 2017, had 170, 80 billion dollars uh, under management. And I think the next ETF uh, comes somewhere around 70 or 60. So it's by far the most popular and the largest uh, ETF as of today. Uh, a big uh, discussion uh, throughout the next few minutes is going to be about also whether ETFs have some kind of consequences on efficiency of markets, price discovery, other kind of quality measures of capital markets. And for all of these discussions, I think it's also good to have a, a perspective in terms of how big these guys really are. They have been growing tremendously over the last few years, but if you sort of try to put them in perspective uh, in terms of size, then currently they seem to be uh, around uh, globally, which I'm, I guess there is some uncertainty about the quality of those numbers, but roughly speaking between four and five trillion dollars. Uh, in terms of equity and fixed income markets and that compares to a total size of 160 trillion uh, of those markets overall. So still ETFs or sort of the capital invested ETFs is still sort of around 3 to 4 percent of total market cap. So we're talking about a very important um, asset class and investment vehicle. I have to be careful with the speakers here. Okay. There's a strategically best place on the stage. Um, and um, and uh, but they're still not uh, you know, not that big. And as uh, as Per said, I'll try over there. The you know they're most likely one of the biggest innovations in financial markets over the last 20 years. I would uh, sort of sign that statement too. Now uh, I think it's pretty important to have an idea about um, sort of how these uh, products are set up so that actually they can be traded on an exchange. And uh, and here basically you see um, such a structure that basically has the ETF asset manager or the ETF sponsor as being the company that basically issues the ETF shares. And then the, I think the most important role in this whole setup is played by what's called authorized participants. So these are basically broker dealers, large investment banks, special players in the markets that uh, basically make the primary market for the ETF shares. <laughs> so these guys basically go out to the capital markets and buy the securities of the underlying basket. So the securities of the index that is supposed to be tracked uh, and then basically uh, pull together those securities to this basket of securities that underline the ETF and exchange that basket of security with the ETF sponsor in exchange for ETF, what's called creation units, which is basically pools of ETF shares. And so then these APs basically have these ETF shares and then with those ETF shares go out to the market and sell them to the uh, you know, regular investors. And so that would have been the description of sort of how ETF shares are created. But basically these APs also do the opposite. Uh, and, and I'll come back to that in, in more detail in a second. But in some situations they will buy back ETF shares from investors. And then basically exchange those ETF shares with the ETF sponsor to get back the original basket of securities and then again throw those or unwind those securities in the capital markets. So basically the APs are in, bet in between and they play a very important role in basically sort of creating and redeeming ETF shares and making sure that the underlying securities are also basically in possession of the ETF sponsor. Now the way they do this is by basically uh, sort of uh, ruling out arbitrage opportunities 
So basically the idea is that these APs monitor the market, they monitor how investors are trading those ETF shares and what prices of these ETF shares are doing, and then they compare the prices of those ETF shares to the prices of the underlying securities that they are supposed to track. And if price differences open up in either direction, then they will step in. So for example, if the ETF shares, because they are hot and everybody wants to have them, trade up uh, to a premium, so they sell at a higher price than the underlying basket, then what these guys are gonna do is they're gonna buy more of the underlying securities to create more ETF units to basically sell more ETF shares to the, to the public. So by selling more ETF shares, they're gonna sort of you know, reduce some of the demand pressure on the ETF share side, so they lower the ETF shares price. And similarly, by buying more of the underlying securities, they will move up the prices of these underlying securities until a point in time where again, hopefully the ETF shares will match the prices of the underlyings and basically will roll, rule out any price deviations. Um, and also sort of, you know, I'll come back to this, this process of arbitraging away price difference is obviously a crucial process, otherwise you would have sort of uh, big gaps and big differences between those prices. Um, and usually it works very well, but then uh, one of the discussions or one of the debates is how well it works during crisis situations. And I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but there's some evidence that sometimes in very particular situations it might not work as well. Um, also to give you an idea about how many APs are usually supporting a given uh, ETF fund, uh, on average it seems that there's 34 APs associated with, uh, with a given fund. So there is some sense of diversification and some sorts of risk sharing across, uh, across APs. So it's usually not that there's only one or two uh, authorized, authorized participants involved. But of course, this number is very heavy tilted to, this, to the huge, to the large ETFs where there's lots of APs. If you might invest in an ETF that is relatively small in terms of market cap, then it might be worthwhile checking how many uh, authorized participants are actually supporting that fund because it might be many, many, way fewer APs if the ETF is a very small one. Now, um, as I said, or, as I was already said several times, the key advantage now, uh, given the setup, is that basically here uh, investors can trade those ETF shares. And the key thing is that if you trade as an investor those ETF shares, that does not necessarily have any consequences on this part here. That means you can trade ETF shares and it's not going to have an impact on the underlying portfolio. So an ETF, if you're selling an ETF share that does not have any, not necessarily have any impact, that basically any of the positions of the ETF sponsors have to be unbound. So there's no corresponding trades, okay? And that sort of ensures that there is a lot of, uh, sort of that you can trade those ETF shares during the day and that there's lots of liquidity. Trading volume on the investor side is a multiple of the redeeming and creation uh, activities over here, right? So there's not the one-to-one -one mapping. And that, of course, is a, is a great feature because it lowers uh, transaction costs that usually are um, a challenge or at least a, um, a, an issue to think about for index funds, for example. So this is sort of uh, the, this liquidity in the secondary market, which is a key advantage of, the, of, the, of ETFs. What is also important to keep in mind is that uh, this arbitrage, which of course, again, not just from an academic, but I think also from an industry perspective, is very important to keep prices in sync. You can also arbitrage away price differences in the secondary market, so you don't have to rely on these authorized participants. If you sort of just, just so to speak, an investor, and you observe that there's an ETF that is traded at a premium, you could still look for an arbitrage strategy that, you know, in principle, you could also, of course, yourself buy the underlying basket, which is maybe not, uh, not uh, a very good strategy in terms of cost and sort of implementability and feasibility. But you could look around that there might be other ETFs uh, that basically track the same index and are not trading at a premium or a very highly correlated index. Or you could actually look even into other markets such as derivatives markets or future contracts that also track the same index or that also link to the same index and then come up with an arbitrage strategy in the secondary market that still tries to sort of balance off and, and, and profit from price differences. So in principle, given this setup, there's lots of mechanisms that should ensure that the price of ETFs is very closely in sync uh, with the price of the underlying basket and there, there's no sort of persistent or sustainable or long-term price differences. Um, a final comment before going a little bit into the industry perspective is that actually one thing that when I sort of looked more closely into ETFs that was a little bit surprising to me is that actually they are not as homogeneous as you might think. So there's actually quite a lot of uh, variation in terms of how ETFs are set up. I just list here a couple of different examples. That's not an exhaustive list, it's just an illustrative list. 
uh, a very fundamental principle difference is in terms of how you actually do this part here. Uh, so the simple, I think conceptually the easiest way to think about this is that the APs actually buy the securities of the underlying index and then exchange this and so that ultimately the ETF sponsor owns the underlying asset. And, and that's what's called a physical ETF that's very common in the, in the US but not as common in Europe. What you could also do of course, because ultimately you only want to track the returns of the index, right? That does not necessarily mean that you have to own <laughs> all the underlying securities of the index. You would track the index through other mechanisms by buying, for example, derivatives. And if you would uh, basically sort of create this link between the ETF and the, and the underlying index, not by buying the, the components of the underlying index, but by buying futures contracts, swap some kind of derivatives to give you exposure to this index, then you're actually not owning the underlying assets and then it's called a synthetic ETF. And that's going to have some impact in terms of the risks that you face as an investor because if the ETF uh, follows this synthetic strategy, then of course you're exposed to issues such as counterparty risk because you're involved a lot with uh, derivatives contracts and, and, uh, and similar sort of uh, investment vehicles. So that's one dimension to keep in mind. And the other one is that a more recent development is that actually uh, there's more what I call, I'm not sure whether this is a very standard term, but I call them exotic ETFs popping up. That means not just ETFs that track an index, but they do some add-ons. I think those that are relatively well known are leveraged ETFs. So they basically also take on leverage to basically promise not just giving you the return of an index, but giving you the return of an index times a multiple, like times two, times three. So these are products that lever up. Um, there's also e ETFs that basically give you the inverse of the market, of the tracked benchmark return. These are called bear uh, ETFs or inverse ETFs. So they basically give you the opposite exposure to the market. And then more recently, there's also things popping up such as active ETFs that basically give you some kind of exposure to an active strategy through the ETF construction or smart beta ETFs that give you the ETF structure with exposure to a smart beta uh, investment strategy. I think the key thing here is that if one in, you know, thinks about investing in ETFs, I think it, it, it's, it's important as from an investor point of view to carefully look into the details of the ETFs because they do certain they do some different things and are not as homogeneous as one might think. Now very quickly uh, on the industry, again, I think um, many of these things might be well known. Here is some information on basically an ETF overview, I think at the end of 2015, in terms of size and in terms of how many different benchmarks ETFs that are available are tracking. And you see that there's a, a center that basically the ETF industry it's still very US focused and in the US it's focused on either broad market indices or large cap. Um, fixed income is also kind of catching up and sort of uh, reaching sizable uh, amounts but other issues such as commodities and currencies are still kind of relatively, uh, relatively small. Um, the, the growth of ETFs has been you know, documented and commented on in, in, in the press a lot. Here you see again for the US equity market the overall raise in market capitalization, that's basically the blue, the blue area. And then the little orange top one is basically how much of that market cap uh, increase, uh, uh, sort of how much of that capital is through ETFs investment. And so towards the end of this graph in 2016, uh, the amounts of capital in, in sort of ETFs was roughly 10% of the total market size of the US equity market. And again, that's only for equity and that's only for the US. If you look at it in at a global scale, also mixing in fixed income, that fraction would actually even drop uh, a little bit lower. And another thing that I also mentioned earlier is that uh, the advantage of ETFs is this liquidity that they are traded intraday. And actually they are traded intraday, so they are a very liquid product. Here what you see is basically the total uh, dollar volume, again over time, on, uh, in US equities. And you see again the black line shows you the fraction of how much of the trading is actually through ETFs and you see that that basically over the last few years was relatively consistently across 30 to 35 percent. So ETFs are very very actively traded and of course that trading volume right does not have much of that trading volume does not have any impact on the underlying portfolio structures. It's just trading of ETF shares and exchanges of investors. Good so to come to the sort of an, an overview very quickly on the benefits and costs uh, of, uh, of ETFs. I think the obvious ones were already mentioned a couple of times. So there's cost efficiency A through the structure or actually all of it comes through the structure. 
it's either in, it's, it's in transaction costs, because again, if you sell an ETF share, that does not necessarily have any impact in terms of transaction costs uh, in the underlying. So it's basically only the liquidity of the ETF share that drives your transaction costs, not the liquidity of the underlying asset. Uh, and there's lower fees because again, the distribution and the selling of the ETF shares is very different from how you sell uh, usually mutual fund shares. So overall, uh, if you look at the fee structure of ETFs, they are, they are certainly on the low side and offer like a low cost uh, alternative in terms of investing in markets. And they offer liquidity through the intraday trading. There's a couple of other uh, benefits uh, of ETFs, uh, which are maybe less, le you know, maybe second order, not as important, maybe a little bit also less clear. But in terms of transparency, usually the investment strategy is relatively clearly defined because usually you track an index or you track a benchmark. Uh, holdings, there's also, at least for the US, very clear requirements in terms of how they have to uh, communicate and report uh, their holdings, which is at a daily frequency. So basically every day you can exactly figure out what uh, an ETF, uh, what kind of underlying securities the ETF is actually in holding and in possession of. Um, there's, uh, there's aspects that, you know, with uh, you know, ETF shares, you can actually short ETF shares. So if you have a negative perspective, or a negative view on some ETF, then you can actually reflect that view through shorting uh, that ETF share, which is, uh, for example, uh, also from an academic point of view, a bit of a, of a challenge for mutual funds, because we might in our studies criticize mutual funds for being maybe excessive in terms of fees or not giving you a good return in terms of their returns, but I cannot do much about it because I cannot short the mutual fund. So I cannot reflect this uh, in, my, in my trading strategy. I can avoid it, but I cannot short the mutual fund. With ETFs, I can. If I have a negative view on an ETF, I can actually actively short that ETF share. And then there might be some tax advantages. I'm not a tax guy, so I kept this very short, and it's country specific, so that, that might vary a lot. But basically, uh, for the US tax law, there are some advantages of investing in, a, in an ETF relative to investing in an index fund. Now, uh, very quickly, because I'm running out of time uh, very quickly, and I also want to have enough time for discussion and for months. Obviously, this whole discussion about ETF is also a discussion about active versus passive, which is uh, maybe even a broader, a broader issue, because in principle, uh, ETFs give you a passive uh, or provide you with a passive investment strategy. As I mentioned earlier, now it seems there's a switch that, uh, or there's a little bit of a, of a shift that there's now always going to be active ETFs or smart beta ETFs that seem to combine the ETF feature with more active strategies. But in principle, this whole shift of assets into ETFs, I think, also comes along with this debate about how much value is created through active management and this overall discussion about active versus passive management for different investor clientels. Um, now, I don't want to go too much into details here because otherwise I, I might be uh, dragged uh, uh, along and sort of so, you know, start running out of time very quickly. But uh, I think that's, in general, uh, a very interesting topic. And, of course, uh, in terms of the of the academic literature, there is uh, certainly some skepticism from our point of view in terms of how much returns on average are created by, uh, by active strategies, uh, especially relative to the fees that are, again, on average charged. Now, coming back to potential issues, uh, to kind of wrap up this little introduction here. Um, as I said already, ETFs are actually more heterogeneous than you might think, uh, and that heterogeneity might have some consequences in terms of the risk, so I think it's worth being aware of it, and maybe also asking for some sort of common classification schemes. There is some debate in the literature that because they are so liquid, uh, there might be excessive trading, because there's other literatures out there that show that especially individuals and retail investors trade too excessively, and so maybe sometimes they need to be protected by being in a product that you can't trade as much as you want to. I'm not a super, I'm not a super big fan of that explanation, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, that's sometimes brought up. I think what is kind of interesting is to think about is there some risk that ETFs suddenly disappear uh, or that there is a sort of counterparty risk and you feel like you have a relatively safe asset because you have a passive, you're investing passively, but then suddenly it disappears. I think in principle, you know, this could happen as also mutual funds disappear, but that usually does not have a big impact uh, in terms of the, of the capital that you have invested from an investor's point of view. Of course, uh, if you think about this heterogeneity in the ETFs and how they're constructed, or if they're levered, or if they buy a lot of derivatives positions, then of course counterparty risk to some extent might play a bigger role. But then in many markets, again, you have market microstructure features such as uh, clearing parties and, uh, and sort of margin calls and collateral requirements that usually try to mitigate those issues. So from our point of view, 
the literature would argue that those risks are pretty manageable and are not very substantial. And then the last point uh, before I'm going to uh, wrap up is actually about this notion between, uh, uh, between sort of ETFs and crisis. So in 2000, or recently, there was a couple of events of so-called flash crashes. So very, very abrupt and very, very quick uh, price drops for no obvious reasons. Uh, I think one of the most famous ones was in 2010, actually in May, so roughly eight years ago. And in that, in that flash crash, ETFs were hit most, or they were among those assets that lost most in value. And so there was a couple of papers then investigating why that actually happened. And they found out that exactly those authorized participants who are sort of at the center stage for the ETF construction, they completely moved out of the market during the flash crash and did not perform their arbitrage activities uh, for whatever reasons. So that stimulated the debate that's also going on at the SEC level in the US, for example, recently about the different mechanisms to incentivize or penalize or motivate uh, authorized participants to also provide liquidity during crisis periods and not only during periods where they kind of enjoy providing it, to ensure that ETFs do not suddenly sort of open up a big gap to the underlyings during, crash, uh, during crashes. But that seems to be an ongoing debate in the, in the area. Now, I will not talk about this in, in detail, but basically there's also some discussion about that because a lot of capital is moving into ETFs and passive investing, more broadly speaking, that that might have an impact on the efficiency of markets. There's less price discovery Prices tend to deviate more from fundamentals. Maybe also some shocks get propagated because ETFs are sometimes very hot or sometimes there's liquidity shocks to institutional investors and they buy or sell a lot of ETFs that these shocks might be propagated to the underlyings. The bottom line is from an academic point of view, these mechanisms all make sense. They could all be there, uh, but the empirical evidence how strong they are, how important they are is very mixed and ambiguous and still sort of open to further research. So to, to sort of uh, conclude, from an investor's point of view, from our perspective, uh, I think it's a clear solution because it offers a liquid product. Uh, it offers a, a low cost uh, investment a vehicle uh, to get exposure to passive, uh, to broad markets, which in our context is very consistent with how we broadly think about investment strategies, especially for retail investors and households. For financial markets, I think the answer is less clear. Uh, you know, there's different debates as I just outlined about potential benefits or costs that these ETFs have. I think what ultimately, you know, at this, at this stage in time, I don't think one has to be particularly worried about either ones because I think globally speaking, ETFs are still a relatively small asset class. So I think their current impact on the quality of the of markets is uh, manageable and not that big. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, please. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Do you hear me? Good. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, ETFs from a, a user perspective, uh, mostly as an advisor at Handelsbank. And before I get started, I should, uh, a small disclaimer, Handelsbank is uh, owner of Exact, which is Sweden's largest owner of uh, Swedish, Sweden's largest ETF provider. But Handelsbank also provides uh, mutual funds in terms of both passive and active. So you can say that we are very good at um, diversification, which is the 1.1 the course in finance. Uh, it's, it's a free lunch. You can say it's a that's how we work at Handelsbank and both, both kind of, of products. Uh, and I'm going to stick to the questions in, in the invitation pretty quickly, actually. The first question is, is what are the pros and cons? The second one was... Are they a threat to correct pricing and financial stability? And the third one is, uh, why are ETFs less important in Sweden uh, than in many other markets? So I'll just go through that. And uh, as again, from, from a user uh, advisor uh, perspective. So if we start with the, the first issue here of the pros and, and cons, I think there are a lot of, of pros uh, for, for the investors. And, and it's a very effective way of getting market access, of course. It's a, it's a very versatile product. You can use it for short term, for long term, tactical, strategic, liquidity purposes. Then there are a number of, of purposes for which you can use them. Um, mostly they are also quite cheap. Uh, that doesn't apply actually to all investors. If you have a Swedish retail investor, you buy a foreign ETF, which is listed on another stock exchange outside Sweden, you normally have to pay 
a lot of exchange uh, FX fees. So it might be not that cheap uh, after all. But generally speaking, of course, there is a very cheap way of uh, investing. Uh, I think one of the main advantages is that they are uh, fair in, in many ways. And that's not always what you can say about things on, on, on the financial markets. In th they're fair in the same price for all investors. Um, you also pay your own trading costs in mutual fund. Uh, if somebody trades a lot in that mutual fund and you don't, you have to pay their trading costs. But in an ETF, everybody pays their own trading costs, which I is a good idea. Uh, also, uh, in an ETF, it's difficult to, to front run panics. It's an, in a traditional mutual fund, if one big investor leaves the fund, the fund has to sell the most liquid, perhaps the best investments first. And you might, as a late mover, be stuck with all the bad investments in that fund. Um, also, as a, in the ETF market, makes it possible to access uh, advanced strategies that normally as a retail investor you would not have access to. So there are a lot of advantages um, for, for uh, in the ETFs. And also, of course, the, the liquidity uh, could also be mentioned as a big uh, pro for, for the ETFs. But there are some, some cons um, as well. Uh, one being that uh, they don't mix very well with the uh, mutual funds from a practical perspective. It's both the settlement issue, which is an ins mostly a Swedish issue, but you have different settlement schedules for uh, mutual funds and ETFs, which makes it for practical purposes difficult to handle if you want to be invested in the market all the time. Uh, also, the trading systems or the infrastructure, so to say, behind is, is very different. There's one kind of systems for ETFs, the same as for other securities like like uh, equities uh, and funds move in an entirely different technical universe, uh, which means that, uh, which is quite antiquated still in some times. Uh, so it's very difficult to ha have those together move between mutual funds and, and, and ETFs. Actually, I think the, the, that the reason people still use faxes for some reason is, is funds, because you actually use faxes still to some extent. Um, also, there's a lot of ETFs that are increasingly complex. I mean, the starting point was you wanted to replicate the market, like with the Spider, the first ETFs, but you're seeing more and more complex funds, and you're seeing more an, uh, an increasing number of ETFs as well, uh, which makes it tricky, of course, to if as long as there were only one fund on, on the S&P 500, for example. But as Michael has shown, there, there was uh, thousands or at least hundreds of different indices and, and, and funds. Um, each slightly slightly different, uh, and I actually heard yesterday that you can today there are more equity indices than there are equities in the world. Uh, so it doesn't really help, does it? There are not so many ETFs yet, but I think there there will be eventually. Uh, and then there's the question of liquidity: whether the liquidity is actually there when you really need it, uh, of course. And I think that uh, goes especially for fixed income uh, products, where there's not an exchange traded um, underlying, but whether banks. And other market makers um, might not be there uh, there when you need them in in a market downturn. Uh, so, so my main conclusion here is actually, and I'll come back to that. That's the ETFs. I think it's, it's a great product, but it's only as as good as as their investors. You can benefit a lot, but it depends entirely on how you use the ETFs, whether you can benefit from from all their all their pros. So that's why I put the, that conclusion. Uh, title, it's not them, it's it's us, it goes back to. Uh, and that's one, one example here. Uh, this is a study from Research Affiliates. This shows the index of uh, all the different ETFs that have been created in the US uh, for, for a number of years. And you can see how the index for, for, the, for the various ETFs, before the index was, the ETFs was launched, that's in the middle here at t equals zero, um, there was actually a uh, positive outperformance by those indices at 35 basis points per month. That's almost 5% a year. That's almost 15% from three years before the launch until until the start of the uh, of the product. Um, so that means that what but this means is that ETF providers they choose the trendiest, the the sexiest e ETFs indices underlying, uh, and eventually. And actually, yeah, there's a local maximum on the day here, wh when six months before launch, when, when the ETFs were, were decided, so to say, in, in some kind of investment committee. And then after the launch of the ETF, as you can see, there is no outperformance at all, as you would expect. Uh, so what seemed like a great idea when, when, when they created the ETFs was actually a market performer. Uh, 
where uh, if you look at the exact figures, a slight underperformer, four basis points per month below the broad market. So, so it's very difficult to outperform the market just by buying ETFs. I thought, no, is there a small ETF? No, all ETFs. All ETFs created uh, in the US compared to the overall uh, US uh, stock market. get it why would you expect an excessive return well people well the thing is that my point is is that all the ETFs that were created were created in sectors or factors or, or whatever that were performing nicely before so this is a great example of, of performance chasing uh, not from the investors but from the ETF providers uh, and of course you would expect those to the people buying those expected them to continue to outperform of course, after, but they didn't, because after all, um, it was very difficult to forecast the future, and they just performed in line with the market after they were launched. Um, uh, Michael mentioned the fact that um, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about mo more and more money being passively managed. I think that's actually a big, uh, big myth. Uh, of course, it is true that there is a big shift from active managed funds and actively managed portfolios uh, into ETFs and into index funds. That's, that's um, of course, that's entirely true. But the fact is that those ESI funds are actively managed by other managers, by uh, financial advisors, managed account managers, retirement funds, etc. So there's still the same amount of active management going on. It's just going on at a higher level. It's not going on at the security level, but it's going on at the asset allocation or risk management level, if you want, where it does matter m a lot more than on the security level, which I think in the end is, is, a, is a good thing because it means that you do th the things that is important and where it really matters. But on the same time, of course, it doesn't mean it's a lot easier. It's uh, easier to underperform as a... Uh, manager of an uh, active mutual fund, but it's very easy to underperform as an active asset allocator as well. Uh, so you have just said kind of just moved the issue to a level higher up from, from the security selection to the asset selection. Uh, also, as um, Michael mentioned, there's something called the exotic, I also use that word, exotic ETFs. And this is one of the most exotic ones here. Uh, the Velocity Shares Daily Increase VIX Short-Term ETN, which is not really an ETF, it's an ETN, which means that it's a, it's a note. This one was issued by uh, Credit Su Suisse, I think. Um, and the, tic the ticker of this was XIV, which is, of course, the backwards of VIX, VIX index. Uh, and this uh, product was supposed to benefit from a fall in volatility. So when the volatility was falling and which was lower than expected, you would get a nice return. And during last year, especially 2017, the volatility was consistently below expectations. There was a great return uh, in this um, ETN uh, until uh, volatility increased. And this um, product went from 140 to 6.04 in just a matter of a few days. It was eventually liquidated at, at that uh, level. Not a very good in investment. Uh, so that's one example of, uh, of what I call the LSD, leverage, shorting, and derivatives uh, products, which are not entirely bad, uh, of course, but when you use a lot of derivatives and leverage at the same time, in, in this case, in something which is not very transparent, it wasn't such a great uh, idea after all. Actually, it said in the prospectus for this product that the long-term value is zero, but people still bought it. Uh, there is another kind of um, ETFs uh, which is not as highly geared, uh, and that's when you invest in a subset of the market, uh, some kind of factor tilt, or uh, that's been called the factor zoo. If you read fr from our French, there are three factors. According to one academic studies, there are 447. I found another one with 600 factors. Uh, and the reason there are so many factors is, of course, that there are so many studies and there's so great computing power. So due to p-hacking, I mean just doing a lot of studies until you find something which does work in your backtesting, you can uh, come up with all kinds of fancy theories which don't work in theory, just as I showed in that performance chasing graphs. Um, so there's a lot of problem with um, 
ETFs being created out of these sometimes very fancy factors. Uh, and also I think that people often forget that what might look as a very good performance of a, of a factor or a tilt of some kind is actually just changing valuations. They become more expensive. And uh, when they do that, it might be not uh, such a good idea to invest in it after all. Um, so the main conclusion here, very simple. If you don't understand it, don't buy it. Um, also, um, there is a great focus in the ETF market on, on cost. Of course, there, there should be. But I would like to point out that cost is not always the most important thing. Uh, here is an example, and these are actually mutual funds, not ETFs, but it is the same point. This is Handelsbanken's Sverige Fund Index. It's actually the oldest index fund uh, in Sweden, and one of the oldest funds overall. It was created in 1976. Uh, and also this other fund, and it's actually, I should say, one of the most expensive ones. Uh, and this is Avanza Zero, a fund which is was created uh, a few years ago and got a lot of attention because it has a zero management fee. Uh, but you can see that despite this, Avanza Zero has a zero management fee. Uh, it has underperformed uh, Handelsbanken's Sverige Fund by about 13 percentage points over just four or five years. And the reason being that Avanza Zero uh, invests in the uh, OMX S30 index, which is a very narrow benchmark index, uh, and the Sverige Fund then invests in uh, the entire Swedish stock market. And over time, I think you could expect um, uh, smaller companies to outperform, especially over this time they have outperformed, and therefore it does matter which kind of index underlying you look at. Not all index funds or not all ETFs are created equal. Next issue, uh, are ETFs a uh, uh, threat to correct pricing and financial stability? I'd say, generally speaking, no. Uh, the main reason, as uh, Michael said, that they're still just too small. And it seems like we have slightly different figures. But in this chart, also from the, from the US, uh, you can see that ETFs own about 6% uh, of the overall stock market. Um, uh, that should be compared to mutual funds, which are 24%. So ETFs are 20% of the overall fund market, but they're only 6% of the overall stock market, and households still directly own 36%. So uh, just by size, I think they're actually too way too small in most cases to, to matter a lot. Um, that said, um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether... Um, ETFs distort the market and whether actually the ETFs may extend the trends that if an uh, equity is overbought being too expensive, the ETFs would actually um, extrapolate that and, and increase the kind of leverage and, and the distortions in the market. I think that's completely wrong and I'll try to explain why. Um, most people, uh, many fund managers think they actually follow the index. That's entirely wrong. They don't follow the index, they are the index. They are what all the investors in the market do together uh, is create a kind of equilibrium pricing, which is, of course, the index. So investors are the index. And uh, by definition, the passive investors, the index investors, they own the index, right? Everybody agrees? Yes? Um, so if they own the index and the market is the index, well, active investors altogether also own the index by definition. They can't own anything else. They have to own the index because the passive investors own the index and the market is the index. So, uh, and if, uh, and that's a mathematical identity as I see it. It's not a, even a, a view, it's, it has to be that way. But, um, so what drives the market then? Well, when active investors, when they change their preferences, if they think the company has become a very great investment idea, they bid up that security, the index weight of that security will increase, um, of course. Uh, but the passive investors, do they buy it? No, they don't need to buy it because they own really own the entire index, the entire market. Um, so they will not change um, the pricing of the market. I mean they're just free riding on, on the pricing that was created by the active investors. So the entire idea uh, about um, uh, passive investors distorting the market I is due to the the fact that um, active investors are smarter. 
but I don't think they are. If you look at the entire active part of the market, and they all try to outperform the market, of course, but because they are the market together, uh, for every smart active investor, there has to be a dumb active investor, which doesn't outperform the market. So I think it's very uh, clear that the active investors here, they are the dog, and the passive investors are the tail. It's not the case of the tail of wagging the dog, as you say, it's actually the tog, dog which is wagging the tail. And finally, why are ETFs less important in Sweden? Uh, first, some figures. Um, if you look at the ETF under management as share of the total fund market in the US, as Michael said, about 20%. In Europe, a lot less, but growing about 4%. In Sweden, only about a half a percent. Uh, you can also look at ETF turnover as percent of the cash equities turnover. 22% in the US, 11, 12% in Europe, and only 2% uh, in, in Sweden. Uh, uh, you can see this slight difference here that, that it seems like in Europe and in Sweden we trade the ETFs a bit more than they do in, in the US for some reason. But anyway, it seems like we're, we're way behind the US market uh, especially. Uh, I think there's a number of reasons here. When it comes to private investors, there is, is a strong history of mutual funds, very simple, very easy way of investing, which people like, generally speaking. Uh, there's also a kind of a home bias in Sweden. Swedish investors like the Swedish market, where there's not a lot of uh, ETF providers available. Uh, and as, as I said, if you invest in, in um, Global uh, ETFs, it's a lot more costly and a bit more complicated. Also, th there's a fairly limited availability um, in the local market. Um, also, perhaps most more important is that ETFs are not available in PPM, in the fund insurance wrappers on in occupational pensions. So the entire pensions market, which is the savings market which grows the most, you can't buy ETFs, generally speaking. And uh, perhaps even more important is that there's a vertical integration uh, of the main distributors like the, the banks and, and some of the insurance companies and there's a kickbacks for other distributors from the mutual funds which means it's difficult for the ETFs to enter the market whereas in other markets which are more open uh, where you're independent advisors uh, ETFs have made bigger progress. Also when it comes to the institutional investors I think that in Sweden you have a very large number of smaller institutions and a few very, very large investors and those very large investors then tend to buy the underlying assets themselves, the, uh, the, the Swedish stocks uh, and they, are also they also have a home bias, they like to have a lot of Swedish stocks, they don't really see the point in buying a Swedish ETFs and because they're so big they're ab able to use derivatives and also foreign assets for, the for their risk management. And when it comes to smaller institutions to a great extent, they use uh, cheap discretionary asset management or discounted funds. So the cost differences between a, a fund and an ETF is not as great for an institutional investor as it is for a retail investor. So that was my main um, points here. Uh, so I think that my general conclusion is that uh, ETFs is a great innovation. It's a great product, but you can only benefit from it if you're a smart investor. Thank you. So, uh, to start it off, Mike, do you have any comments on on Matt? Um, sure, I think, oops, okay. <laughs> um, I think that um, uh, there was a lot of interesting points here. I think um, uh, I completely um, support this view that I think um, one has to be careful and smart and uh, <laughs> and uh, inform yourself uh, when buying ETFs. I think they're very heterogeneous. I think it depends on what are the underlying indices and the underlying benchmarks and how, are, so how is this exposure created. So I think it's not uh, something that one can argue um, is a simple, necessarily a simple investment. Uh, so I think that's uh, something that I would uh, completely support. I also think that um, in terms of price discovery, I also agree that um, uh, obviously active investors um, you know, do the work to sort of do the price discovery and passive investors are, are kind of following along. I think the, the question from a broader perspective is a little bit to think about um, how much of active investing do you, for example, need uh, 
to uh, to create price discovery, right? Do you need um, a Warren Buffett and hedge funds and and some active uh, funds to sort of do price <coughs> discovery, or do you need um, an active fund industry as we currently observe in many countries uh, with a lot of underperforming with a lot of underperforming funds um, for the price discovery? So I think in this case. Um, I agree on this, but it, it's not obvious to me, sort of in the long run, how the share ultimately of, of, of uh, passive versus active investors will pin out. And the last comment is just that um, I recently read a study that actually in the US, most investors in ETFs are actually institutional investors and not retail investors as one might think. Uh, but at the same point in time, uh, of course, I think that uh, coming back to your asset allocation um, <coughs> argument, that of course a lot of this is also comes with this automated uh, robot advising uh, directions where uh, you have wealth fund embedment and these kind of players that are institutional investors and buy ETFs, but then offer basically cheap investments with broad diversification aspects to 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 retail investors. Thank you. Okay, please. Could you just comment on 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 two things there? I think the. On, on the price discovery, uh, the ETFs are just a small part of, of the story. If you look at the, the, the longer <coughs> trend, if you go back like 50 years, the price discovery in the stock market was a, was a lot, lot slower, mm -hmm. uh, mostly insider information, and, and those that were really analytical and, and actually perhaps even went to the company to get the annual report and, and read it and, and took uh, uh, informed decision on, on that. Some of these people were able to benefit immensely, um, uh, as did, did Warren Buffett in his, his, his early days. It's much more diffi different, difficult now because the information is so much more available uh, and there's so much more computing power and information available and actually you know, some hedge funds and some p uh, fund management yeah, like, like BlackRock, they use satellites to track how many people are going to Walmart and they, they use net scraping to, to see what you're talking about in your emails. So, so the information is this total information overload. So I think that information has grown exponentially uh, just mm, over the last few years. Uh, and the fact that there's a few a small part of this, the stock market which is owned by passive investors in that bigger context doesn't really matter, I think. Uh, also, when it comes to the, 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 of course, costs going down, it's very interesting to see that in, in, the, in the UK, we heard a big reform a few years ago called the RDR, uh, which was more like the MIFID uh, for the rest of Europe. Uh, what happened when they tried to level out the playing field for, for retail investors uh, was that independent financial advisors, well, instead of being advisors, <coughs> they started to doing, as I said earlier, the, the asset allocation themselves uh, using ETFs. Why was that? Well, not perhaps because ETFs were always the greatest in uh, in investment, but because the invest th it was the cheapest investments, which meant that the, the advisor could hike their fees. So actually, after the RDR in the UK, the end investors pays more than they did before this consumer reform, uh, even though the investment themselves are cheaper. Okay. Please. Question Just on uh, Frederick. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Frederik Nordström from the Swedish Investment Fund Association. I just uh, had some comments about your, your the last picture about the market share. Um, you said the data was from Bloomberg. Just, uh, we have problems calculating the market share of ETF in, in Sweden. Uh, since it seems like it's, it's mostly an institutional uh, product. And they buy them in, at the London exchange and no one reports about the Swedish investors. They don't report to us or anyone else how, how much ETFs they buy in, in Frankfurt or in London. So that's one problem with the, that might be one explanation why mm -hmm. it's so, so low. Um, and then I, I just have some questions for you, Michael, about the price discovery issue. How, how, do, you, how do you regard that in, in, we're working a lot with ESG issues in sustainable finance and you know, uh, uh, screening away <laughs> companies is one of the one of the methods we're using. Are you are you saying that it only needs one or two, two maybe then two active investors to sort of uh, uh, make this strategy not to work in practice, or or how do you how do you how do you see on the ESG issues if you? So yeah, maybe just very very briefly. I think. Um, 
I don't, I don't think that the, how many investors you need to uh, have prices appropriate to reflect information, I think is, uh, does not necessarily impact how, how successful an ESG strategy is. Uh, I think for the ESG, this filtering out strategy to work, I think um, what you need, uh, and then I think maybe you know it's a bit of a of a, of a side track, but I think what you basically need is that that uh, prices do reflect that these companies are not liked, so to speak, by large parts of the market, and thus do become riskier, uh, basically driving up their cost of capital, so that some of the projects that are polluting and are sort of bad ESG projects are not getting realized because they're not they're not profitable with the higher cost of capital. How that pricing mechanism, if you, if you have a lot of active investors to do this, or, or if, a few, if, a few, if a few are sufficient, it's very hard to test empirically. So I don't, there's, no, there's no conclusive answer. It's this question about whether there's a marginal investor who sets a price, which could be one person, so to speak, in our theory, in our concepts, or whether it's the average investor. So in this case, I don't have good empirical data for this, but I think for the bite of an ESG strategy, I don't think that that's uh, mattering a lot. Yeah, and I could also comment on both on the data. I think the figures I've shown uh, were, were supposed to show the Swedish ETFs as, par as, as a percentage of the Swedish stock market. So not from a, an investor point of view, but actually from, a, from the market point of view. But it might still be not 100% uh, correct. Uh, and when it comes to ESG, I think it's important to realize that although e ETFs and index funds are passive investors, the choice of index is active. So what you've seen, a big trend over the last few years where index funds and also some ETFs switch or are created with ESG-oriented indices. So it is possible to be an ESG investor uh, in an ETF or index fund, but you just have to choose a different index. Friedrich, again. Yeah, sorry. Just one question on that. <coughs> how, how's your, how, how do you see that the strategies on, on voting are? Are, are? Are ETF managers, do they vote? Do they do they also engage in ESG in that way? So that's a good, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly how the voting is organized in terms of the setup, but there has been a debate in the literature that if you move more from active to passive investment, that, that might have a negative impact on corporate governance because there's going to be few investors who actually engage with the firms and enforce good governance. And a couple of studies recently seem to have documented actually the opposite effect. That somehow, I don't know exactly, they did not really dig into how the mechanism is, but somehow actually the share of passive investors had a positive impact on the governance of the firms in the US. So in this case, it seems that the empirical evidence suggests that, that you know, moving more to passive investors does not, does not necessarily lower active shareholder activism or sort of impact taking on firms. But how that exactly is done, whether it's through specialized companies who kind of pool those votes and then exercise them, uh, I don't know. But it seems so the effect overall is not a big issue. Sounds a bit counterintuitive. I think so too. I was. Uh, it's. A, uh, I found it a bit puzzling. Yeah. Uh, I think the um, and that's also how they the, that study was uh, basically pitched is that I think exactly would expect the opposite effect, yeah. but that it didn't seem to materialize. Okay, please. Um, actually, you you sort of answered uh, the question or my remark is I, I'm representing a passive investor actually exact uh, fun funder who who is. Uh, the main provider of local ETFs here in the local marketplace. And when it comes to, to uh, corporate governance and things like that, w we, we are, are very active on, on, on that side. And uh, I would argue that uh, if you talk to the Black Rocks or, or uh, representing iShares, they, they, are, they are arguing that they are one of the most active uh, in terms of corporate governance globally right now. So. I mean, I think maybe also as a quick comment, it seems that it's also a bit of a labeling issue about active versus passive, right? And again, it's about active versus security selection versus asset allocation. So obviously active and passive can mean a lot of things. Uh, and so I think it's kind of interesting to see that you can be invested in index and not picking individual securities, but still be active in terms of uh, your voting rights. While I'm waiting for more hands, uh, I read in, I spent most of my life in fixed income market. I saw in the FT last, last week that there is such a thing as fixed income ETFs. Yeah. Fund. It's sort of, does that exist? I'm just asking out of curiosity. Is there a supply? In Sweden or globally? That was uh, in the US, I think. I think glo I had it on, my, on one of the slides. Okay. I don't remember the numbers, but they were pretty big, sizable. So there's several hundred billion dollars in fixed income ETFs. Okay. But also, as Matt said, 
the arbitrage there is more complicated because yeah. the underlying is not usually so liquid. Yeah. And so there is studies that show bigger price discrepancies between okay. net asset values and the, and the price of ETF shares, where then you run into the next issue that it's not obvious who deviates from fundamentals because those net asset values are not observable mm. because they're not very liquid underlying. So it's not obvious that the ETF shares deviate from the true price. It could be a combination of both. Yeah. So they're a little bit more difficult in terms of the pricing. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I have a, a question regarding the, the graph that you showed, Mats, uh, about the outperformance of ETFs sort of disappearing prior to launch. Uh, do you think that's due to sort of p hacking or, or data mining that, that you were looking at that recent performance and then you, you were targeting certain factors that maybe doesn't really exist in reality? Or do you think that's more attributable to the sort of crowding out effect as more investors actually go into these strategies? No, I think it's mostly the, the first effect. It's, it's actually an opportunistic behavior of the, in of the ETF providers. Uh, you do a lot of studies, you pay a lot of researchers to come up with good um, cases and good in investment ideas, and then you choose the, the, the indices or the factor tilts that seems to have the largest outperformance. Now it's, it's very difficult to come to the market with an index that are underperformed the market for the last few years. It's never going to be a big success. Uh, so you take the ones which look good, um, but eventually most of what you did was either turned out to be either just plain luck or statistical chance uh, I in the in the data, or it was mean reverting. And it's, it's well shown that when it comes to uh, active funds, there is a very strong mean reversion. So if you uh, underperform for three years, uh, and um, as an active manager, you're often fired after three years, you typically outperform the, the following years. So I think this is exactly the same thing, but in, in, a, in a quant uh, way instead. Do you know anything about the dispersion? I mean, there must be... Of course some it's who discover it sort of in good time and some very late. Yeah, but you will always find some, some funds which are like growth oriented and some which are value yeah. oriented yeah. And, and that will tend to, over time, uh, 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 balance out. Michael. I would like to just quickly comment that I think in the, from my point of view in the ETF sphere, I don't necessarily think about under or over or out performance overall. I, I view them as, as, as a class it's an asset class that basically provides exposure to indices and, and markets, very broadly speaking. Whether individual indices outperform other indices, like a small cap versus a large cap, or a value versus growth, or whatever. I think that comes back to more decisions of asset allocation and sort of this, sort of this, this mix. But in my point of view, I think uh, you know, an ETF, I think the great innovation is that it gives you this exposure to a broad pool in a liquid way and in a relatively efficient cost way. And I think here's maybe also, you need to understand that in, if you look at the US index fund sphere, then for example, there's a couple of prominent studies dating like to 2003, there was roughly like 100 index funds uh, on the S&P. So these are like commodities, they're all doing exactly the same. But the dispersion in fees among those index funds was 70, 80 basis points uh, 15 years ago. That's huge for the same product, right? And I think that's where, from our perspective, ETFs come into play. Because then you have the spider and other sort of ETFs that compete uh, much more narrowly in terms of their fees and just give people exposure about the S&P. And then I don't have any views on whether the S&P is going to outperform NASDAQ or Amex or whatever kind of other Russell uh, US index. That's not, uh, for that argument, um, that's not the relevant perspective from our point of view. It's just you get exposure to that market and, 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 and that's, relatively speaking, in terms of the data, a much better exposure than if you would go through a standard index fund or the average index fund, at least for the US market, where we had data dating back to that time period. Yes, so I would add to that that I, I agree totally, but you have, when you invest in an ETF, you have exactly the same behavioral economics problems sure. that you have in, in all other kinds of investing, uh, and all, but you also have the same principal agent problems. Uh, and th that's the reason for many of these performance chasing and, and other problems that you see in, in, in the ETF universe. There has been, I think, as you touched upon, a debate now and then in the US on is there a need for regulation of the market? So that can we trust that the author and authorized uh, participants are doing their job properly? So that in your opinion, is there, is there a need for better <laughs> regulation of some sort of the market? Or can we sort of trust that the, the incentives <coughs> are such that it will continue to 
function the way it should? I think that's a tricky, as always, the questions about regulations are, are sensitive, let's put it this way. Um, um, obviously, I think from, from, from uh, uh, our point of view, I think, it's, it's, I think one should have a debate about it. I think um, I'm expecting the growth in ETFs to continue, especially with the popping up of, of uh, this sort of automated advice, which again, there's some asset allocation happening in the background, but it's on a very different level than if you have individuals picking asset classes or, or security selection. So I think these kind of things I expect over in the future to, to keep growing, and those kind of products usually all go through ETFs uh, in terms of their investment strategy. So I, could, I expect those uh, asset, uh, those sort of vehicles to grow. And then, of course, uh, most of these investors are going to end up being retail investors, mm. where then I think it becomes an issue in terms of uh, doing periods of, of stress, uh, of crisis. Uh, do you need to have mechanisms in place to ensure liquidity? where this needs to be regulation or some kind of incentive penalization scheme where the market participants agree. I mean, it's also in the interest of the ETF fund sponsors mm -hmm. to ensure that their APs are around, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's about a, a sort of a, a more explicit compensation scheme uh, that does not necessarily have to be called regulation. Um, I don't know, but I think having a debate about it uh, for the upcoming years is certainly very useful. Is there a consumer protection issue? I mean, the zoo that Matt was talking about, I, I mean, I think to, so I've been involved a little bit over the last year uh, about consumer protection issues, about fees in the active mutual fund uh, area in the, in the US. I think there's debates about this, and I think there have been similar debates and similar regulations in Europe with maybe varying success. But I think um, you're obviously going to have uh, similar debates in terms of, uh, of ETFs and, and ensuring liquidity mm. during particular periods of crisis. I would say yes. I'm Helen. It works, yeah. Okay, so uh, my, my name is Helen. I'm from the exchange side. I'm just listening to, to sort of the role of the APs. I see at least in Sweden, um, there is sort of an agreement between the issuers or the providers and the APs to actually provide liquidity. And that is much better sort of, you know, a more efficient solution than if you have sort of a price movement in the underlying markets, the stock market, you will have order driven sort of effects, which means that you know everyone will disappear in that market. In this market, you actually do have market makers and APs standing for the price. The, the spells might be wider, but they're actually there. In the US, no, though, I think the, the one sort of aspect you, you referred to earlier, I think that is, that is a situation where, where the market wouldn't sort of work um, in parallel because the underlying market was closed or you had problems in with the pricing in the underlying market. And then in the ETF market, uh, that didn't follow the underlying market, which meant that that uh, the circuit breaker that should kick in in the ETF market didn't kick in at that point. And I think that is the, the concern and the regulation we need in the US. We don't need that in, in Europe, and okay. but that is needed in the US. Okay. Um, I've, um, I heard that Exact was the first issue of issuer of a leveraged ETF. Uh, and I know that almost half of the ETFs in Sweden are leveraged ETFs. Uh, why do you think that is? <coughs> and how are they? How are leveraged ETFs used in practice? I think I'll let uh, <laughs> Pelle answer that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I must say that uh, just the mere fact that we were the first one in, in the world launching those ETFs has sort of created the interest. Uh, locally, and at that time, I think it was around two, 2005, to buy us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at that time, there were also a, it was sort of in the conjunction with, uh, with uh, that uh, uh, Avanza and, and Nordnet uh, with some size, and providing these vehicles to, uh, at that time uh, very tra uh, interested in trading uh, clients and things like that was 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 a, a hit and then to answer your other question because to some extent I would say that uh, having that early uh, success in, in uh, the bull and the bear maybe was sort of a disadvantage to us in, in the long run because I would say that the ETF industry has moved to sort of more Delta one building blocks, more more portfolio construction, and in, in this market, uh, 
we haven't been able to provide all, all these uh, building blocks because we have been using traditional funds instead and, and, and not ETFs. So I would say that uh, the way our market look, uh, the local market looks right now I is, uh, is a function of what kind of products is provided. But we will fix that, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have run out of time. Uh, I have uh, okay, so okay. I One last question then. I have a very general question. I mean, Michael talked about price discovery. You talk about, uh, Matt's talked about efficient market. You said that uh, smart, uh, it's more difficult nowadays for smart active money to beat the index. It was much easier when Warren Buffett started out his business. But is that because the market is more efficient now or is it because the market is less efficient now due to all this passive money. I mean, 40% of the equity investing in Europe nowadays is passive, 50% in the US, more than 70% in, in, in Japan. And I mean, if, if the majority of the market is investing on price rather than value, to me that it's a less efficient market. Uh, and and uh, I think actually think the, the tail is wagging the dog now. <laughs> and passive investing is, 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 is worse than communist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How much time do we have? Yeah. <laughs> you have one minute. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think, uh, I mean, these are things that a lot of people worry about. Uh, I don't think we yet have a, a good, uh, a very good answer. The one thing that, you know, given the one minute I could say about this is that, um, A, of course, it's tricky to measure explicitly market efficiency. What people like to do is to look at, for example, how much asset returns can move with each other and some kind of correlation measures to kind of see whether there's a lot of, of sort of swings in the market that are just driven by basically the liquidity demands. And there are, there's a lot of studies that show that since ETFs and passive investing was growing so much that these kind of co-movement of asset returns has increased a lot. And people would have inter interpreted this as evidence that the uh, market in some sense became less efficient because of all of the passive money. At the same point in time, if you go actually back in history, then it seems some people have found that if you go back to the 30s, 40s, you have similar levels of co-movement. And then in between, there was a large drop over the, over the 30, 40 years in between. And now it's coming back up. So even at earlier periods in time, when maybe it was even, you know, there was less competition for, for performance, it seems that similar that statistics indicating a loss of efficiency were similarly high. You also find similar trends in terms of this increasing co-movement for currencies and other asset classes where actually ETFs and passive investment in general are not as big as in equities. So I think from the, from the academic empirical sort of the hard evidence, I see your argument and I think it's a reasonable argument, but I don't think necessarily that the empirical data would, would support this view that market efficiency has decreased substantially. Yeah, and, and I, s I think that, as I mentioned, the informational efficiency of the market has increased uh, enormously uh, and, it and it continues to increase as an exponential rate, really. Uh, just having a, a Bloomberg terminal, you can almost all the data in the world just uh, at, your, at your fingertips. Uh, and with all the, the data going on with, with um, as I said, um, internet scraping and, and satellites and, and everything, it's... it's uh, the slightest, slightest thing um, happens in a way in China somewhere will be reflected in prices increasingly quickly. And, and that means that I think markets are, in, in that sense, more, more efficient than before. And in comparison to that, I think that uh, a small part of passive investors don't make much of a difference. Okay, this is a debate we maybe could continue at some other time. We very much appreciate you coming here. We very much appreciate you doing these kinds of seminars. And if anybody of you sort of has a topic you feel strongly about, uh, please uh, contact us and we'd be happy to, to make another seminar on. We're talking about artificial intelligence as a possible next topic for a seminar like this, and we'll come back to that. But we're open to, to dialogue. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.